then it really hit me. I'm on the moon. I'm on the moon. And the excitement, the wonder, the thrill, the uh, adventure uh, of it all, and uh, as Buzz Alder described it, it was this magnificent desolation. And you kept thinking, nobody's ever been here before. My footstep is the first time there's been a footstep in that spot. And so uh, that, never, that wonder never left. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. Half a million people worked to make possible the Apollo missions to the moon. The program proved one of the great achievements in human history. Among the legends of Apollo is Brigadier General Charlie Duke. An Air Force test pilot turned NASA astronaut, Charlie Duke was the Capcom for Apollo 11's epic first landing. He was the first person to talk to the crew on its surface. We copy you down, Eagle. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Three years later, he made his own footprint on the moon, landing with Apollo 16. He is one of only 12 men to walk on its surface. A special thank you to our patrons, whose support allowed us to film General Duke's story. Support our mission to preserve our American history at patreon.com slash American Veterans Center. Now here is General Duke on his epic journey from the Earth to the moon. I was uh, born in Charlotte, North Carolina, but mostly raised in um, uh, South Carolina. Uh, this was all during World War II, so we moved to Cal My dad joined the Navy, and uh, we moved to California for a couple of years. Then he went overseas. We moved back to South Carolina. And uh, then when he came back, we went to Florida for a year and then back to South Carolina. So growing up in in World War II, uh, my heroes were all the military guys. And uh, since my dad had been in the Navy, uh, I said, well, I want to go to the Naval Academy. So uh, I didn't even know you could fly airplanes from the Naval Academy, but <laughs> when I went. But I went off to school, uh, prep school, uh, Admiral Farragut Academy in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, to get prepared to get into the Naval Academy. And uh, it was a good move for me. Uh, I learned how to march, salute, obey regulations, live on my own at 15, started at 15, and uh, make my bed and all that stuff. So uh, I got to the Naval Academy and I felt right at home. And, uh, uh, then I realized you could go, uh, they gave me some airplane rides at the Navy, at Naval Academy, and that did it. I, I said, uh, airplanes have a lot more appeal to me than ships. So um, back then there wasn't an Air Force Academy, and uh, this was in the mid-50s. And uh, so they would allow West Pointers and midshipmen to volunteer for the U.S. Air Force, up to 25% of the class. And so uh, I uh, had a choice to make. It was, uh, should I be a naval aviator or an Air Force aviator? And uh, the decision was made by a doctor at the Naval Academy during my senior year. He told me, I said, Mitch and Maduke, you have astigmatism in your right eye and you don't qualify for naval aviation, but the Air Force will take you. So I went to flight school, and uh, this was in the summer of 1957. Uh, was flying T-34s and then T-28s, and then I went to advanced, uh, not advanced, I went to basic training, and uh, that was uh, a T-33, uh, first jet that was in, in flight training. And then from there, I went to advanced training, F-86, uh, the interceptor models. And so I was an interceptor pilot, came out as an interceptor pilot. Tell me a little bit about serving in Germany uh, around the time of the Berlin Wall going up. What kind of missions? And uh, we were sitting alert. Uh, by this time, we had F-102s. I was in the 526 Fighter Interceptor Squadron. And I got to Germany in uh, summer, uh, May of 1959. It was also, the, that was the beginning of NASA and also the beginning of uh, astronauts. Uh, and uh, Sputnik went up when I was in flight school and uh, changed the whole dynamics of the uh, Cold War. And uh, so I, I enjoyed uh, 
being in Germany, it was a great experience. Uh, we had a lot of uh, exciting scrambles uh, to intercept things uh, along the Czechoslovakian border and East Germany. So it was a it was a good assignment. I really loved it. I got finished in Germany in 1962 was my third year, and uh, I felt like I ought to go to graduate school. So I applied uh, to graduate school through uh, uh, Air Force Institute of Technology, and they sent me to MIT. And my second year there, uh, I had a thesis, had to do a thesis. Well, NASA. Let me start with MIT had the contract to build the Apollo guidance and navigation system. So they needed two pilots to help out on this system, and that was my thesis. And uh, so as a, I was working on this uh, program, I met a lot of uh, astronauts, came up to visit to see what this thing was going to look like, this guidance and navigation system. And I'd never met anybody who was so gung-ho about their job and uh, excited about their job. And I, I asked him, uh, Charlie Bassett, I, I was killed shortly after that, but uh, in an airplane crash. But uh, Charlie said, I said, Charlie, how did I get this job? Uh, he said, you got to finish your degree and go to test pilot school and you might have a chance. So I followed their device, uh, advice. Uh, and. Uh, so when I graduated uh, in the summer of 1965, uh, yeah, no, 1964, uh, I got selected to test pilot school and, and started out in uh, test pilot school in Edwards Air Force Base. And the, the next year I graduated and went, to, went on staff at the test pilot school uh, and that was in July of 65, and uh, then in September, NASA had another call for astronauts, and it was my chance, so I, I volunteered and was selected. It started in 1966. And you were part of the crew for Apollo 16, but you were also indelibly linked to Apollo 11 because of your role as capsule communicator, uh, CAPCOM for yep. short. So explain what that role is, first of all. Well, uh, still today, uh, CAPCOM is the only uh, the only person in mission control who can actually talk to the crew uh, in flight, and so it's always an astronaut. I, I, I'm not sure now, but then it was always an astronaut, and uh, that gave you a familiarity. We all knew one another. Gave you a familiarity, uh, and you were, and you could talk in their lang pilot language, if you will, and you relayed the information that was generated in mission control, go, no go, and monitor this system, that system, whatever, and then you transmitted that up to this crew, uh, and uh, they would respond and. So you had a conversation with the crew and everybody else in mission control was listening in and advising the flight director on their systems. Uh, and so you basically were the voice of mission control. And uh, it was a very important job. You had, to, you had to say it right and you had to say it in uh, pilot language, if you will. Uh, and. Um, and they, they really depended on you transmitting the, the information that was correct uh, and no mistakes. And uh, so I, I did that on Apollo 10, which is the first time we took the uh, lunar module to the moon, but no landing. And two months later, uh, we, Apollo 11, we landed. And uh, since I'd done that on Apollo 10, Neil Armstrong invited me to come do it on Apollo 11, just to keep that whole team together. Uh, we just moved from 10 to 11. And we were well trained, and except for the landing part, we had done it all. And uh, so it was a um, so tense, it was dead silence. If nobody, I mean, if, if you weren't transmitting the, the information uh, to, within the room, everybody was monitoring on their, their system, and uh, we'd had a series of problems uh, on the descent. 
the first we had communication problems. And the mission rules was if you lose communications for 30 seconds, you abort the mission. So we were reorienting the spacecraft to the dis different antennas. Then we got uh, computer overloads, which was really, I thought, very serious. Uh, without the computer, you cannot land. And so we were having these computer overloads, uh, but the computer engineers were saying, we'll go on these, th uh, on these alarms flight. And then when it, we got to 7,000 feet above the moon, the lunar module pitches down, so the windows are now pointing at the lunar surface. And Neil apparently looked out the window and says, we can't land here. We had him targeted into the wrong place. So he levels off at about 500 feet, and he flies several miles horizontally across the moon then pitches back up to start this far. He picked out a landing spot, stop his forward the velocity, and then lower the lunar module now. Well, that five miles at 500 feet or whatever it was uh, used up all our reserves and the fuel. So now we got on minimum fuel. And uh, uh, we had a margin of 4%. When we got to 4% in descent engine, uh, we were going to abort. So uh, the propulsion engineer said flight 60 seconds. That means he had 60 seconds to get on the, land, on the ground. So I said, Eagle, 60 seconds. And uh, then I said, Eagle, 30 seconds. And uh, he wasn't on the ground. But according to my stopwatch, it, uh, it was uh, 13 seconds later, uh, I heard Buzz Aldrin say, contact, engine stop. And, the tension was through the roof in mission control. In fact, the tension in my, in me, was higher in mission control than it was when I landed on the moon on Apollo 16. So it was very close. What was the atmosphere in mission control once you knew there was a successful landing? Uh, we all erupted. Uh, the, the, it was like punching a balloon. The, all the tension left and. Uh, we were clapping and cheering, and uh, then uh, didn't last long because uh, Gene Kranz, the flight director, said, get back to work, you guys. Make sure this thing is safe and we can stay. So we had a series of stays, if you will, T1, T2, T3, as it went on down, and we made sure that the lunar module was nothing leaking, and nothing broke, uh, all of those things. So we finally got down to uh, okay we're for the final stay, and uh, we were okay for the, for the rest of the, the 24 hours on the moon. Well, let's talk about Apollo 16 now. First of all, for most of us who will never know what it's like, describe blastoff. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, liftoff in the Saturn uh, uh, five was uh, a tremendous experience. It wasn't uh, loud, the fire, the the sound went sideways, not up to the spacecraft. And we were up on the top of a 360 foot tall vehicle. And uh, the only thing I can remember was a vibration. You got four engines, there's five engines at the bottom pushing with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And the four on the circumference, they wiggle to control the trajectory. And that wiggling down there comes through this aluminum structure, shaking like sideways, taking you sideways from side to side. And we're strapped in real tight, and, uh, but you, you can feel the vibration. And if you look at it, it was a high, a high frequency, uh, not as high as space shuttle, but really high frequency, and it was a good amplitude. And uh, to be honest, I got a little nervous. Uh, I didn't remember people telling me it was supposed to shake this hard. Uh, but uh, so I, uh, I, I was holding on and, uh, and John Young was saying we go, he'd flown to Saturn before, and uh, we go and mission control says you go. And for the first two minutes and 30, no, 41 seconds was first stage on our flight, it, that vibration never stopped. And uh, it was always the same, but not uh, it, not any pogo, but just side to side. And that's really the only thing I remember from, uh, 
from the ascent uh, was that vibration on the first stage. And about three and a half minutes after liftoff, we're now on the second stage, they jettisoned the cover over the win windows and you can see outside for the first time. And that was spectacular. Uh, there's the Atlantic Ocean and then deep blue and then the blue of the, uh, the atmosphere that fades into the white and then at the top of the window was the blackness of space. It was uh, life transforming really. It was incredible. And uh, the G level wasn't so bad. And uh, I found out later that I, my excitement on liftoff was 144 beats per second in my heart. As I was really, I was really ready to go. And uh, <clears throat> John Young, uh, his was 70, so uh, he, he was the cool one on the flight. Uh, but that's the only thing I can remember is just the vibration. We talked about the, the drama of the, the orbit and the landing on Apollo 11. You had your own challenges in lunar orbit that threatened the potential landing. What was the problem and how did you resolve it? Well, it, uh, the problem occurred about an hour before we were scheduled to land, we were on the back side of the moon out of contact with Earth. And the command module, we were in an orbit that was 60 miles on the back side and seven miles on the front side so that we'd have the best landing chance. Well, he had to change his orbit on the back side to 60 mile circle. Uh, so he'd be in the right position when we, if we had to abort on descent. Well, he couldn't, the main engine was out. And, and not the ignition of the main engine, but the control of the main engine. And uh, when he reported this, uh, John Young made the decision, uh, don't burn. And when he said that, we weren't going to land on the next rev. Well, I mean, if your heart can sink to the bottom of your boots in zero gravity, ours did. And, uh, so we, now the landing's no go. So we come around the back and mission control, they were shocked and, uh, and uh, we were down. And uh, so John um, told, they dumped all the data down and said, well, we'll look at it. Well, we went around the backside, came around again, and now we're uh, coming around to be four hours behind schedule. And the moon is slowly rotating out from under us. Uh, and so if we get a go, we got to go over, fly cross range. Well, they, they didn't, uh, right before we uh, just, let, let's see, I guess it was uh, on, the, they, they said, we, we're working on it. So we disappeared around the back and came around the front. And they said, uh, we can't fix it, but we know what's wrong, and this is your workaround. So they gave Ken a, uh, uh, a procedure, and he said, you go for a burn on the next rev. And then right before we went, uh, a, uh, a loss of signal, they said, you go for landing. And boy, did our hearts, eureka, you know, I mean, I can't explode, explain the excitement we got. And, uh, so we were go for landing, and it was the last rev uh, that we could uh, make our landing site. So six hours behind schedule, we started our descent. Manningly's burn went well, uh, and um, so we didn't worry about that problem anymore. And uh, we started down and made a successful landing, probably within 200 yards of where we intended to land. So John did a great job. There had to be points where you're just stopping for a moment and thinking, I am on the moon. Well, that happened right away after we landed. You know, we were, I'm on the moon, I'm on the moon. And uh, you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you could hardly believe it because we were six hours late. Now we're here and man, the lunar module's working great. And uh, we're going to spend 72 hours on the surface. And uh, uh, so we were very excited about it. And, uh, uh, but, but they changed the flight plan on us. And uh, so instead of going outside for the first excursion, we took off our suits and they said, go to sleep for eight hours. Well, that was a little hard, you know, uh, four or five hours after you landed on the moon, somebody says, go to sleep. Well, 
uh, that didn't work very well. But we got, I finally got about four hours sleep after taking a sleeping pill. And uh, next, uh, so we got out, and uh, and that then it really hit me. I'm on the moon. I'm on the moon. And the excitement, the wonder, the thrill, the uh, adventure uh, of it all, and uh, as Buzz Aldrin described it, it was this magnificent desolation. And you kept thinking, nobody's ever been here before. My first, that my footstep is the first time there's been a footstep in that spot. And so uh, that never, that wonder never left. Uh, it, everywhere you went, you saw something different. You saw uh, detail. The, the photographs that we had studied of our landing site only had resolution to 45 feet. So objects less than 45 feet, you couldn't see in these photographs. But when you got there, you could see little tiny pebbles. And so there were a lot of craters, there were a lot of boulders, there were a lot of things like that scattered around our landing site that we didn't even know were there. And it was a lot more uh, rolling and rougher uh, terrain because the car was bouncing through these little craters and over these little rocks and stuff like that. So it, it was uh, a th three days of wonder, if you will, and excitement. Uh, what were the main priorities of this mission? Well, the uh, Apollo 16 uh, was the second of the J missions. The first, mi first three landings on the moon were 24-hour uh, maximum stay on the lunar surface. But they wanted to do more science. They wanted to do more exploration, so they extended the stay of the lunar module uh, to three days on the lunar surface. So they gave us a car and uh, uh, other experiments. So uh, we were the first and only, turned out, only uh, uh, mission to land in the lunar highlands. Uh, and if you look at where Neil Armstrong landed versus where we landed, it was eight or 9,000 feet altitude difference. So the idea was uh, these, these rocks are going to be different than what they found on the Mari. And, uh, Sure enough, they were, but they weren't what they expected. They expected two kind of volcanic rocks, but there was uh, hardly any volcanic rocks up there on the moon uh, in that area. So all the experiments, uh, all of the uh, the use of the car, we were the second with the car, uh, was designed to uh, understand what the lunar highlands was composed of. And so we worked very hard to... Uh, uh, to get the right samples and to deploy all the experiments that uh, we were to, to do. And, uh, and everything worked well except for one experiment, we, uh, the heat flow experiment, uh, which required me to drill two holes into the moon. And, uh, but the electrical system was out, so we abandoned that, uh, that uh, uh, that experiment that was a, but that was the only failure we had uh, so it was a very scientific exploration of the lunar highlands was the whole quote big objective of Apollo 16. You know that every little kid watched you guys drive around the moon yeah. in those moon cars and wanted to be you right? Yeah <laughs> well John drove he had to really focus on the, the uh, area ahead of him I was the na navigator and the travel guide, if you will, because without a, without a, as you bounce across the moon driving, the antenna's going like this, so you don't have any TV. And uh, so I'm describing these, what we're seeing. So, well, on your right, Houston, I, and I, every 50 meters, I'd take a picture, and I see this there, and I see that, and so I'm navigating for John, and he's taking my instructions, and getting us down to point A or uh, Plum Crater or whatever we were going to. And uh, so I, I just kept talking. I, it was fascinating terrain that we were going by, and I wanted them to understand uh, just from the pictures and from what I was describing. Uh, you tend to overestimate the number of rocks on the surface. You know, you were saying 40 percent, but boy, you look back later and you count the rocks and it wasn't nearly that high, but I mean, that's the excitement that comes in at, uh, 
and the enthusiasm and the uh, extravagance, I guess. I, I left two objects onto the moon that were uh, personal. And uh, uh, 1972 was the 25th anniversary of the United States Air Force. It was formed in 1947. I was the only astronaut Air Force officer going to the moon that year. So I had this idea, let's say happy birthday Air Force or happy anniversary. And uh, so uh, I got in contact with the Pentagon in some way. I don't remember how I did it, but anyway, I, the Air Force said that's a good idea. So they minted two special coins uh, about the size of a silver dollar that commemorated the 25th anniversary of the Air Force. And I left one on the moon, I dropped one on the moon and took a picture of that, and the other one I brought back. It's now on display at the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. And the other was uh, a, an idea that I had to include my family. And uh, we, tra we trained in Florida, but we, the families all lived in Houston, so we were gone a lot. So to get my kids excited about what Dad was doing, I said, boys, y'all want to go to the moon with me? Yeah, Dad, that'd be great. And so uh, uh, I said, well, of course, you can't really join me on the spacecraft, but let's take a picture of our family. So I had a, a little snapshot of my family and got permission to take it and leave it on the moon. And so uh, the last thing I did was to take this picture out of my pocket and drop it on the moon and took a picture of the picture. And uh, it's still there, it's all burnt up now after 50 something years. The temperature on the moon when I dropped that picture was probably a hundred and, probably about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was getting hot on the moon. The higher the sun gets, the hotter the surface gets. And uh, you can't feel that in your spacesuit, but you can see the effect of it when you drop a plastic picture and it starts to curl up almost instantly. Uh, so those are the two things I did, and then we ended up uh, with the uh, Moon Olympics. Uh, we decided to do the Moon Olympics, and uh, and uh, we were going to do the high jump, and then we were going to do the broad jump. And uh, down here, with all my equipment on, I weighed 363 pounds. Up on the moon, 60 pounds. And so. I was in shape then, and I, was, I could start bouncing, and John was bouncing. So when I bounced, and I said, here we go, and I straightened up. Well, the center of gravity went backwards, and over I went backwards. And that life support, if I hit on that life support system and it breaks, I'm dead like that. So do something. And I had the thought, roll right. So I rolled right, and I broke my fall on my uh, right side, my right hand and right leg and my heart and I landed on my back and so there's the earth out there and I'm up flat on my back and John runs over and says that wasn't very smart Charlie and I said help me up John and and but I, I'm still alive and I, I, I had a pressure gauge uh, and it said normal we had a remote control unit up here on our suit and the oxygen supply everything was normal so he helped me up and uh, and I, but my heart was pounding, I tell you. And uh, so at, uh, then I looked up and a TV camera was looking right at me. And uh, Mission Control had seen this stupid stunt. And uh, so that ended the Moon Olympics, I, I have to say. They were very upset. <laughs> and uh, so we got back inside. John parked the car and we got back inside. Two hours later, we left. When you look back at your role throughout the Apollo program, but also just the opportunity to be on the moon. What are you most proud of? Uh, there are two, uh, I think, uh, two uh, events. Uh, one was, the, of course, landing on the moon, being uh, honored being one of 12 that walked on the moon. And that has to be the, the, the tops of my Apollo uh, career. But the second was uh, 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 helping land Lunar Module uh, 11, uh, Neil Armstrong, Apollo 11 on the moon with Buzz Aldrin. That was a great thrill, a great honor for me.